Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. We're going to go ahead and call the meeting to order. It's 7 p.m. I want to welcome you all to our November work session meeting. And I'm going to ask Ms. Anaya to please read the Open Public Meetings Act statement. On Thursday, January 14, 2021, notice of this meeting was mailed to the press and the current of Egg Harbor Township. Notice was also delivered that day to the Egg Harbor Township Clerk and posted on the bulletin board in Township Hall. May we have roll call, please? Ms. Alabarda? Here. Mrs. Bird? Present. Mr. Delabarca? Here. Mr. Ireland? Here. Mr. Price? Here. Mrs. Sullivan is absent. Mrs. Salagi? Here. Mrs. Gilbert Floyd? Here. Mr. Castellano? Here. Can we all please stand and salute the flag, please? Thank you again, everyone, for coming out. Um, both Dr. Gruccio and um, Mrs. Sullivan are dealing with family situations. We wish them the best and hope to see them back uh, with us next meeting. Uh, I want to just take a minute to congratulate um, Mrs. Regina Bongiorno, Mrs. Juanita Hyman, and Mrs. Barbara Salagi for the three-year terms, and Mr. Nicholas Seppi for the first-year term. Um, they are our apparent uh, winners. And the reason I say that is that the county has not uh, released its certified results yet. We do expect uh, they're required to be released by the 15th of November, which is next Monday, so we'll have official results then. Those are our apparent winners. Congratulations to them. Uh, a, a thank you as well to our other candidates, Mr. Mahmoud and Ms. Alabarda. Uh, I think anyone who runs for a board or serves on a board deserves congratulations and thanks. There are many, many districts that cannot find a full slate of candidates and have to either rely on write-ins or appoint people because they don't have enough people willing to step up and serve. It's a, it's a hard job. It's a volunteer job. It's often a thankless job. So um, my hat's off and congratulations to all involved. Um, I'm going to turn the uh, floor over to Mr. Santilli and our administration. We do have a number of presentations this evening. Uh, a couple of items that we'll be voting on either tonight or next week. Thank you, Mr. Castellano. Um, the first uh, presentation is just a uh, update in regards to the New Jersey CUSAC. Um, you will notice uh, as a board in new business, uh, there has been a document uploaded uh, in there for New Jersey CUSAC, uh, and it is our DPR, our District Performance uh, Review. Um, the district has gone through um, and has reviewed the indicators within each of the five areas um, as indicated on the document. The county, uh, after submission, will then also uh, review those same indicators in five areas. And also part of the New Jersey CUSAC regulations uh, require the board to also approve this uh, as well. So with submission next week, uh, you will notice that tonight in new business. Uh, in addition, we are going to uh, present on our 2022-2023 preschool operational plan. And at this time, uh, our Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction, Ms. Lily Moss, and also our Supervisor of Early Childhood Education, Mr. John Tolan, will present on that operational plan for preschool. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Santilli. Um, so, this is just an update to the five-year plan that was shared last year when we started with the grant. Every year we are um, required by the state to update our plan of the operations of preschool to see how we are doing towards our universe. 
So I'm just gonna take you really quickly through the timeline again. So as you guys all know, preschool expansion is free, full day preschool for all three and four year old EHT students. Um, it is funded by the state and our local budget and uh, we are now in year two of five towards our 90% of the EHT universe. So if everyone remembers back in 2020, we received notice of our award. We um, then had the preschool up and running in February 1st of 2021. Um, at that time, we uh, expanded and we had 60 students. And then in March, we resubmitted um, part of our plan and were able to expand more for this year. We'll share with you those numbers. October 13th, uh, we received the operation plan documents. The 18th, we received the actual template. <laughs> so it's a very quick turnaround from the state of getting that template and plan and being able to get it submitted um, in order to submit that plan to the state. So Mr. Tolan is gonna go through with you what that looks like for next year with the expansion. Um, and what our plans are to continue to work towards that 90% by the end of the five years. We're now looking at year three, since the, right now we're in year two. So I'm gonna pass it over to him and let him take you through it. Thank you, Lily. You can so, the microphone. Thank you, Lily. So as Lily said, we have to expand to reach 90% of our students, which is about 810 preschoolers by year five. Uh, this current year, we have places for 450 students. Next year, we're requesting to expand another 105 students for a total of 555 students. Um, this gives a breakdown just where we started, where we are. Uh, so for the February through June, we had 20 students, one high school classroom, 13 at Slay Ball Primary, and six at Garden State Academy for a total of 15 classrooms and 300 students. Uh, we also have seven PSD students. Those, uh, those are our preschool disabled classrooms and they are factored into that 900 number. Uh, here we go. So this year we added, uh, on top of the 30 class, uh, 20 classrooms that we had for last year, we added two more to Gateway and six to Garden State Academy and three to Slay Ball Primary for a total of 30 classrooms and 450 students. Um, with this expansion, we also dropped down our preschool disabled classroom numbers from seven to five as we're incorporating more of those students into the general education population. For next year, uh, we're proposing to add another seven classrooms. Uh, we're looking at putting 20 of those classrooms in district and having 17 of them in provider sites. Um, and each one of those classrooms would have 15 students again for a total of 555 students. So just to give you a little bit of background on our program, um, as we said, it's a full day preschool program. It's six hours. We utilize the creative curriculum, which is uh, comprehensive, it's research-based, and it's one of the four curriculums the state approves us to use. Um, a part of their day, just quickly on here, we have small groups where we differentiate our instruction. We make sure that the students are getting met on the highest end to the lowest end because we have uh, mixed age group classrooms. Um, we do read-alouds twice a day. Every classroom has choice times. This is where they get to explore their centers and learn about different areas um, within our dramatic play, our science, um, our fine motor. Uh, then we go into our gross motor, which is our recess in the higher grades, where we're playing outside or in our gymnasiums. And then we have an hour of rest time. Uh, in addition to this, they also have meals, breakfast and lunch every day, uh, which is also an instructional time. We use, we use this to teach about healthy eating habits and to really extend the learning even further. So a big highlight that we've heard about in the met past meetings here is we're adding on to Slay Ball Primary's playground. Um, I got noticed today that they uh, dropped off the supplies already about a week and a half ago, and the week after Thanksgiving, they're hoping to break ground. Uh, these playgrounds will all be based in the back of Slave Ball Primary. Uh, they will be fenced in and ADA accessible for all of our students. Um, this will be available for all 250 students that are housed at Slave Ball Primary. Um, here's a mock-up of one of the three sites, and then we actually have these two other sites that will also be there. So I'm really looking forward to it, and I know the kids are as well. Uh, so just to give you a little background of what we've done so far as far as our community, uh, we're only as strong as the partnership we make with uh, our, the parents and the families and the businesses within the area. So we have, uh, we formed what's called an Early Childhood Advisory Council. Uh, this council is all stakeholders involved within the programs, teachers, uh, directors, parents, community members, uh, parents club, and we meet 
four times a year. We've had two meetings so far, one at the end of last year and the one at the beginning of this year. Um, the purpose of this committee is to uh, determine needs of the program where we can improve what, um, what resources are available to our families and to really make sure we're best supporting everybody in the community. Uh, we've had one parent workshop already, which was a day in the life in the preschool. Uh, we plan to have one every month from now to the end of the year. So hopefully you'll be seeing a lot more of these in the next presentation. Uh, we had a virtual information session back in July to inform all the new parents coming in what to expect, uh, what our program looks like, what our hours are, and really to have a general Q&A to make sure everybody was on board and understanding. Uh, we did a virtual meet and greet uh, with all the parents and their children right before school started. We had virtual back to school nights at all of our locations. And then we also did uh, kindergarten screenings in the summer. Um, in years past, our kindergartners were coming in the beginning of the year without a lot of background knowledge, a lot of background information on where they were. We screened uh, over 300 of the preschool students, kindergarten students, excuse me, to make sure that we placed them appropriately in their kindergarten classrooms. And then finally, here's just a picture of some events that are happening in the program. We had a uh, fire prevention assembly back in uh, October. To, and we have all the students outside at Slayball Primary, and then we also had a, uh, a um, pep rally that started at the beginning of the year. All right. Thank you all so much, and uh, hopefully uh, we continue to keep growing and reach that number of 810 students in the next three years. Thank you both uh, very much for that information, and, and ultimately uh, for the work that you've done you know, to help this program grow, especially over the past year. I know it's been a big undertaking, uh, a lot of moving parts, and it certainly hasn't been easy during these COVID times as well. So appreciate all the hard work. Thank you. Okay, we're going to switch gears to our next presentation, uh, which will be for our update for ESSER 3 and our grant application. Uh, joining Ms. Moss will be our business administrator, Ms. Chandra and I. Thank you. Good evening. That's okay, I use keyboard, thank you. So, as with most of our presentations, we go through a timeline of where we've been and where we're going. Um, we have presented this timeline a few times as we've been keeping everybody abreast of how we plan on spending this third round of funding from the federal government. So, we were notified of spending. We drafted a plan in the spring of uh, the, road, the plan to come back, the return pl safe reopening plan, excuse me. And then we received in September uh, the notice of award of how much money we were getting, as well as some sub-grants, which we have presented in the past few weeks, or past, past few meetings. Today, we're gonna talk about a little deeper on how the money's gonna be allocated, so that next week, the board will be able to vote on the submission of the grants. As you recall, out of the main grant, you must spend at least 20% on learning loss, and you will see how we far exceeded that because that is one of the biggest goals we have um, to bounce back from this pandemic. Our district learning goals, as a reminder, everything we do focuses on obtaining a closer um, achievement of these goals or a closer <laughs> desire to reach the goals. And now we'll turn over to Ms. Post. I think I missed the slide, sorry. That's okay. This is the allocation of the main award, the 9.5 million, which we knew about last year, last school year, and then the subgrants that came out in September. So the total money we're talking today is 10.4 million. We will walk us through. Thanks. <laughs> All right. So um, as Ms. Anaya just mentioned, we presented a few weeks ago on the different categories and the ways that we were going to spend. So we are now adding dollar amounts to that spending for you, but keeping that same format and understanding how that all ties into learning loss and learning acceleration under the umbrella of continuity of learning, mental health and supports, the multi-tiered system of supports, and of course, health and safety. So continuity of learning is a big chunk of our money. Um, as Ms. Anaya mentioned, here we're really looking at uh, learning loss and learning acceleration. So the idea of how do we help support our teachers and our students in the classrooms to prioritize curriculum, to be able to focus on 
what gaps exist, but not to dwell so much on reteaching, but how do we keep us moving forward? So the tools that are necessary for that are to continue with uh, summer programs and beef those up a little bit over the summer, adding in some more um, activities and choice for students, making those more targeted with more data that we'll have on students this year as compared to last year. Continuing with the kindergarten transition program, like Mr. Tolan spoke about in the uh, last presentation, ensuring that um, our kindergartners, our, uh, our preschoolers who are coming into kindergarten are ready, understand what school's like, get into those buildings. We are able to assess them and get them comfortable with that environment. Continuing with the Eagle Academy summer program, and then adding in some other after school opportunities for our middle school students. So we really wanna take that model that, was, that worked so well at Miller with Aspire and bring that into for our middle school students to help with enrichment, to help with more activities around STEM, the arts, reading, and ELA, um, and math. We're going to devote some more time for our INRS teams to have after school meetings to really design more of those individualized plans and evidence-based um, interventions for students, both in behavior and academics. We're gonna bring in some decodable classroom libraries to um, help with, we started this year, science of reading professional development that will continue into next year. So now giving supplies to our teachers so that they're able to help students, um, not only with that whole class teaching, but then also with intervention. Continuing with that, getting our teachers um, with the training and certified to become trainers in the science of reading, and then also um, in other uh, research-based interventions. And um, of course, for our out-of-district tuition, continue with phases two and three of our Chromebooks. Um, as you know, this year, we distributed to be one-to-one. Uh, -one. And then of course, having our district data analysts and compliance coordinators. For mental health and supports, here we want to bring in um, a true social emotional screener so that we're able to help students and identify students who might need some more support, bringing curriculum around that and professional learning for our teachers around how to implement curriculum appropriately. Um, having a mentor program and a retreat and trainings for our teachers on how to be um, mentors for our students and then continuing with an after-school mentor program for the next three years. And then finally, we also want to, this past summer, we did um, summer connections and tours, especially in our transition grades for students so that they have the opportunity to come into buildings before school starts, go with their guidance counselors, see where their classrooms, lockers, and just feel comfortable. And that can be individual or in small groups. Around the multi-tiered system of supports, here we use our Lincoln um, Data Warehouse where we're able to store all of our assessments and progress monitoring for students. This is what we use to track progress, um, to help design interventions where we are able to look at student history from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade. Um, so we are looking to have a lot of professional learning around that. There's a lot of new features with it. So as those new features come out and it becomes a more powerful tool, we wanna to make sure that all of our teachers, um, especially our intervention teachers, understand how to use it and its capacity. Also wanna bring in some evidence-based math interventions and have training and materials for those teachers um, really focused in grades four to eight. And then having an evidence-based adaptive assessment platform that aligns to all of these pieces that allow us to target student learning use our interventions and aligns with everything that we're doing that I mentioned before. And then finally, under health and safety, as we've spoken about before, um, the beautiful, we're gonna add some more playgrounds for our students in the elementaries and um, starting to design and look at some outdoor classrooms. So we have more um, space available for our students to be outside and learning in that environment, and then the additional high school fields and custodial supplies, of course, to keep up with sanitation. So all of those things together allow us to reach that total number of the 10.4 million. Um, and as you can see, a big chunk of that is in that continuity of learning to help with that learning acceleration and learning loss. And that's it.
Okay, thank you for sharing that information. As you can see, a lot of time and effort has gone into this um, plan. Um, ultimately, this has been something that we've rolled out in the past few meetings. Um, first, we started with just sharing each of these areas that we were gonna be addressing within the grant. Um, and hopefully we've, we've done a good job in, you know, to make sure that we inform the board in regards to how we're going to break down um, you know, that expended, those expenditures within those areas now at this point. Uh, you can see, of course, that what was shared in terms of the breakdown, a, a big portion being in the continuity of learning. I don't think that's of any surprise for anyone um, based off of what we were faced with over the last 18 months or so. Um, but that concludes our superintendent's updates. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for excellent presentations, um, all of you very much. Um, I'm going to open the floor for board member questions. Um, we had three uh, major presentations. We'll be voting uh, tonight on the QSAC as well as the preschool uh, extension and then next Tuesday on the ESSER 3. So I'm going to open it up to board members for any questions for our administration on those three items. I saw Mrs. Sloggy and then Mrs. Gilbert Floyd next. When we talk about putting more uh, preschool classes into the district, how is that going to affect the class sizes of first, second, and third grade classes and the kindergarten classes? So that would be part of our, our budget process moving forward. Um, you know, we would be taking a look at, and we have continued to take a look at our enrollment. Um, matter of fact, we, we continue to take a look at our enrollment on a weekly basis at this point because we wanted to be intentional about our, our planning for the future, not just because of our influx with our support of the preschool program, but of course, just based off of our current state of affairs with students that may be transitioning out that are gonna be homeschooled and now are coming back, the transient population. What we're taking a look at right now is those weekly updates within uh, our central registration office who's been doing an excellent job with updating that for us, which we then break down in a spreadsheet to be able to take a look at um, how many teachers we have in a particular section and a particular grade level to determine our class size. And that is what we look at from a central office standpoint every single week. Before we get off the topic, um, is it possible that the board could get a write a printout of what size the classes are right now? That would be good for us to be able to look at uh, when the other numbers come out. Yeah, we absolutely can, can share that um, and we can make that as part of one of our updates. Um, in addition to that, I probably would say that, you know, you're, you're certainly going to be hearing about it as we start to prepare for, for budget um, preparations as well for next year. Thank you, Mrs. Gilbert Floyd. So I just was asking about the, um, is it the early childhood? Um, I lost the, the other word, the EC, AC. Um, so when they have those meetings four times a year, um, when they, they take notes and different things of that nature, are those notes available? Like just kind of, or the topics that they discuss, are they shared? Or is there, you know? Go ahead, Mr. Tolan, you can answer that. Thank so, you. Uh, our ECAC, our Early Childhood Advisory Please Council. Please use your microphone. Yes. Yeah, hit that. Yeah, hit, 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 hit on right there. Ah, there we go. Sorry. The ECAC, our East uh, Early Childhood Advisory Council, yes. uh, meets quarterly. Right now, um, we're still in the, the process of developing our team, developing our processes. Uh, we can most certainly share those out. Um, we are in the process of also um, developing our Early Childhood website. So what okay. we're putting links in there for that, so we can actually we can definitely put um, a minute notes on there to share. That most certainly can be available. Okay, and just for the, um, I was just thinking about when they said about the kinder the um, screening for kindergarten. Um, so I know we when we do screening is that I'm just trying to remember when does that take place, and the teachers screen the children or do a reading specialist? Ms. Moss, go ahead. You can respond to that, please. All right. Um, so, sorry. Um, 
we used teachers this past year. Um, we had most of our kindergarten teachers participate. Um, we gave our, so we, the way we um, advertised it was for our kindergarten and preschool teachers first, and then we brought in our intervention teachers and other teachers, but we had a great turnout of actual, um, of our kindergarten teachers participating this past summer, so we're hoping to have that again. Uh, we're also looking to expand it to be um, more days this summer so that the students get to actually participate in some more activities and get more comfortable within the school and the school building that they'll be in for that school year. And I'm assuming that all the information and data that's collected for the children goes into the um, makeup of their, of course, their classroom. Correct. Process. So we used the results. We were able to tier the students and then look at other factors, of course, and then be able to make some heterogeneous classes for our teachers. Okay, that sounds good to me. Um, and the other thing, um, um, and Mr. Lagi brought up the um, class size. So, and I think having the numbers for the class size is a for the class sizes currently is a great idea, but I guess I just would, if anyone could speak to the fact that once we started, once we knew that we were going to get the preschool grant and the kindergarten grant, that I'm, enrollment was already, <clears throat> how can I say this, enrollment, enrollment was already something that, hey, listen, when we get more students, of course, that's going to affect our numbers in the classroom. So I just, can anyone speak to the fact that we, I think central administration kind of already knew that and maybe made plans or I'm sure they thought about that prior to when we applied for the grant that that would possibly up the numbers or even just make that we have to increase um, class size and, and the hiring of teachers so so you know one thing I do want to just point out without pulling up the presentation again the a lot of the information and, and what may be jumping off the page and I don't want the board to be alarmed in regards to, to the enrollment um, and, and, and maybe to clarify what information you saw is both three and four year olds. Mm -hmm. um, so just keep that in mind in regards to how that would, you know, transcend into our current enrollment as they progress through the district. Um, so the number that we had was, was a combination. So our preschool program does service both three and four year olds. And I, I'm thank you for clarifying. I just wanted to, because I felt like that may, that may be a little cloudy um, for some people, as far as with class size and enrollment, and anticipating it, because you, some, you know, projected enrollment based on the numbers of students that were com are coming in. Okay, I see. I'm um, trying to get the order right. Mr. Delabarca, Miss Alabarca, and then Mrs. Burton. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Ms. Moss, for the preschool, for the kindergarten screening, do you use the nurses at all for any of that screening or any of the special ed area folks? So special ed, of course, um, is included in that. Uh, we did not actually use nurses this past year, but that is a great suggestion moving forward. Yeah, uh, in the past, many years ago, they did use the nurses for, and they were very helpful in finding some of the concerns the parents might even have when they talk to the parents and that helps them develop into classes. Thank you for that suggestion. Good, Mr. Del Barca? Yeah, thank you. Good, okay. Miss Alabarda next. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'm very excited about the preschool expansion because we know as we build the foundation of these students that a lot of the um, problems we have, you know, hopefully will we'll, um, dissipate. I am a little bit nervous about how many students we're going to be having because are we um, planning on how we're going to get enough buses to transport them to and from school? Ms. Anaya, would you like to uh, comment on that? Absolutely. Absolutely. So on behalf of the transportation department that I know is watching tonight, we are in the middle of um, evaluating restructuring tiers to resolve this concern. Right now there are pre-K through three on the third tier, um, which is very tight already. Expanding will only make it worse. So we are looking at how that works with our own school district and our own busing. 
um, along with exploring some middle school issues as well. So we are rethinking how we think in transportation and uh, we'll be rolling something out shortly to Central Admin and then I'm sure the board during budget process. Thank you. Mrs. Bird oh, yeah. is next. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I wasn't quite done yet, sorry. Um, and this one's for Ms. Moss. Um, so we're screening our, our students going into kindergarten. Are we keeping that data so that as we move forward each year, we're seeing how preschool is affecting their, um, their abilities to go into kindergarten um, on level? Yes. <laughs> um, we didn't, so uh, as you know, I'm a big Linkit fan, and so we do store all of our data. This year, the screening data we did um, because of the COVID restrictions, we were doing a lot on Google Forms, so it is living on a Google Sheet right now, but that data will be put into Linkit for those students um, so that we're able to have that record. So last school year, we did have that information when we did the screening for our students so that the whole point is that we have this complete record of students. Um, we're also going to be able to, moving forward with this preschool, do a lot of screening that happens at the end of the year with the strategies gold assessment also, so that hopefully more of that transition program can be more about true transition program and less about, you know, sitting down and doing lots of assessments with kids like we were this past summer. So that's the ultimate goal is to get um, into more of that authentic assessment with the students and being able to do it in that capacity as we move forward. But everything will be stored so that we have that picture of students from start to, to end with that. But um, yeah, hopefully we will be able, you know, by the time we get to that five year, be able to really look at numbers. Hopefully if we have, you know, three consecutive normal school years, and we're able to really look at the effect of having students, you know, starting in September like we did this year and having full school year of full day pre-K and full day kindergarten, which is this is our first year of really being able to do that. So we're really excited to see where that takes us. Good. All set? Yeah. One more once? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, Mrs. Mrs. Bird. Thank you. Um, on the preschool presentation slides in February to June 2021, when it was first rolled out, uh, we had 14 in-house classrooms, six out, and seven preschool disabled classrooms. Uh, this year, we have 16 in-house, 14 out, five preschool disabled classrooms. 22, 23 on the slide, it said we'll have 20 in-house, 17 out, and it did not list any preschool disabled classrooms on that slide. Um, so I just wanted to know how many preschool disabled classrooms are we going to have? And uh, so I would like to know that number. And I'm noticing on the ESSER uh, presentation on one of the slides, the continuity of learning slide, it has out of district tuition 22, 23 and 23, 24 school years as part of this budget process, um, as part of the six million. So are we uh, closing more rooms? Because we went from seven to five and now nothing's listed. So I want to make sure that we're still having uh, preschool disabled classrooms and we're accounting for them. Because I can't imagine um, we have less special needs students after all this, especially when students haven't had early interventions, services because of COVID. So I imagine we probably ha would have more classrooms. And I understand that we are, uh, we've uh, mainstreamed more students but not having any accounted on that slide is a little bit alarming for me. Um, uh, 15 preschool students to one teacher is, that's kind of a high number for four-year-olds and three-year-olds in a classroom. Um, so that coupled with adding more preschool classrooms, which then ups the first grade classrooms, kindergarten classrooms, population, you know, we have to make room for these kids somewhere. Um, have we considered with these funds adding an aid into these classrooms? In our tier one classrooms, having an aid in there. Um, I'm seeing a lot of, um, in the plan, I'm seeing a lot of summer school, um, after school enrichment, which are all great things, right? Um, 
but what I'm not seeing is like great tier one interventions and quite frankly, not at the fault of the teachers in any way. Everyone's working really, really, really hard. Um, but we had a tier one problem before COVID and we still do. So I don't see much in the tier one structuring that's all um, earth shattering to me uh, as far as bridging like just normal classroom instruction. Um, what, it, what are the research evidence-based programs that we're talking about? Because it, it keeps saying evidence-based, but it's not, it, are, we still, are we talking about Fontes and Pinnell still? Is that, like, what are we doing? What, what, are the, what, are we, what are the programs? So there's a lot of questions. So why don't we try to, can we answer some of them and then Let's try to keep up. All right, so I'm, <laughs> so I'm just going to briefly touch on uh, your question with special education. And I know that I'm going to also share with our administrative team here. So I know Ms. and I uh, will certainly chime in as well as Ms. Moss uh, in a minute. But in terms of PSD and special education population, as you know, through early intervention, we would be identifying um, students. Um, right now, you know, to some degree, that's a little bit unknown because we are in the process of identifying however I do believe on on one of the slides um, there was an identification or an estimation of I believe it's 103 special education um, students that would be locally funded um, you know so that that information is there uh, in some capacity but again a lot of that is going to be determined through that early intervention process as you know um, Miss and I, I know you, you wanted to share some information as well, and then I believe you have some questions that Ms. Moss can certainly talk about with Tier 1 interventions. Thank you. So, you addressed the special that I was going to say right now, there's five classrooms with 39 students, and it's not mentioned because it's not part of the operational plan that the state needs, but that's still something that doesn't mean it's zero, but you did that great job. Then I wrote down the out-of-district tuition, so at the last meeting, we had the two columns of locally district funded swap out for grant funded so we can hire all those interventions. So by putting $3 million of what we would have already paid for special ed placements out of district, think of private like Yale Coastals, we're gonna fund through this grant, which we already would have funded locally so that we can hire all that staff we talked about. So that's not in addition to, that's a swap of our local budget funding. 15 per class with one teacher is with one power also, and the rest I believe I will refer to Ms. Moss because it goes into adding paras, tier one, and evidence-based stuff. Okay, so the tier one problem, which you know we agree on, um, we will be hearing a lot more about that as we go into our regular budget season. So don't forget, we still have our local budget within each content area where this has been a major topic of conversation with all of us on how are we addressing those issues. As far as the interventions are concerned, we're really looking at, like I said, moving into more of um, an adaptive program that allows teachers to assess students to see where those learning gaps are. Right now, um, we're looking at two different vendors, which I'd be more than happy to share with you, and I did share in curriculum committee, um, but we are looking at the research, making sure when they say they're dyslexia screener that it's recognized. So we are still doing our due diligence with that as far as naming names as the specific programs, but I'd be happy to share that with you and the full board. Um, and then another piece is obviously we are really looking at professional learning and you know we're working with the science of reading and letters. It's a two years program and it's very intensive. Um, and so right now that is our main focus for our elementary teachers and our intervention teachers is to really have them focus on building that knowledge and capacity and being able to look at our students and the data on students and how we can shape the instruction using that knowledge. So I know it's not maybe wowing us at this point, but in my you know, opinion, I think we are doing what's best long term and in investing in that. Um, as far as the other evidence base, we're going to be working with Wilson to, be getting, to get more teachers certified in Wilson Reading to help with our dyslexic students on the gen ed and special ed side so that we're able to um, 
have those tier three interventions, but then also taking all of this learning into instruction in the tier one, because there's no program that replaces good teaching. And so for us, that's the focus, is really focusing on that professional learning. And I think you'll see a lot more in January when we start with our content level budget presentations, because that's where you're gonna see a lot of those shifts and changes in that classroom instruction. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for that added information. It helps um, It helps me so much be able to make more of an educated vote for next week. So thank you for adding it and sharing that. While some of these things may not be listed for this purpose, that it is coming down the pike. And while I will not be sitting up here anymore, I will be an eager participant and watching. And I cannot wait to see all the great things you guys have planned. So thank you. Mr. Price. Okay, I just want to comment with great presentations. I, they were very informative and helpful. And I think we all need to realize that this is the ESSER grant, and as we build the budget, this is, this is part of a grant, but it's actually something separate, so to speak. So once the budget comes out, you've got to realize that this is, this is all a grant. And as we, as we build the budget, I think things will start to come out a little bit more understandable for everybody. That's Thank correct, you. and we'll make sure during the budget process we are bringing up the federally funded grants like we usually do. Usually you just see a lump sum number, but now we know what that number is going to be for this grant. So that's, well, that, that's an excellent point, and that was the, the one uh, thing that I wanted to also emphasize when we talk about having the resources to accommodate the preschool students is just a reminder that this expansion that we're <clears throat> doing now beyond uh, special needs is in fact grant funded as well um, and that's what you know our uh, presentation was on tonight the expansion of the program we started this year which was a 2.3 million dollar grant we don't know the, can, can you take a guess what that grant might look like for next year um, because this isn't a, you know uh, well I'll, I'll let you guys just um, um, just sort of elaborate on the fact. So in addition to ESSER, our expanded preschool, which we're continuing to expand, is also a grant funded program. That's correct, and I don't wanna speak about what that number might look like, but I know we originally got 2.3, then we got 3.8, and we're hoping it just keeps going higher, but minimally it'll be what we got this year, which was 3.8 million. From that investment in full day kindergarten, which was way back, 1.5 million, which was worth its weight uh, in gold because it was so needed for students and families. And then uh, it turned in, you know, essentially to be a two for one sale because it more than paid for itself with, with now a $3.8 million grant for preschool and, and growing. Um, and to serve the needs of the students and families. And so anything else on the presentations? Um, and so just now to recap, uh, so tonight, this evening, we'll be voting on our preschool operational expansion and we'll be voting on CUSAC. Next week at our regular meeting, we'll be voting on the ESSER 3. Everybody good? Excellent, wonderful. And we will have public comment soon for, for everyone. Um, but at this time, we're going to move into finance and operations. And I'm going to ask for our committee report, please. OK, thank you, Mr. President. Um, finance and operations committee met at the board office on October 27th. Uh, Mr. Price, Ms. Sullivan, Ms. Bird, and Ms. Anaya, um, we discussed Facilities updates, the Swift Slay Ball Complex parking lot and high school fields are in full swing and the HVAC replacement project is being bid over the fall break. Uh, many others will be done uh, and a full update will follow at the next meeting. Um, business office reported on CUSAC, uh, finance and operations will be presented at the next meeting and overall uh, we do a great job with compliance with the CUSAC. Uh, action items. 
tonight for uh, November 9th, Shore Physicians Group. We're going to take action on student drug testing services and a comprehensive maintenance plan, which is due to this date by um, November 15th. Uh, action items for next week, gifts, grants, donations, uh, policy 6421 is linked now, so you can see what, what um, the purchases are. Uh, ESSER 3, application submission, parent transportation contracts, Atlantic County School Board uh, Association GIF renewal. Can you correct me on that? A C C A S B O acronym? Atlantic Cape County. It's a CASO. Atlantic Cape. Atlantic and Cape May County. That's what it is. A C C. Okay. Association of School Business Officials. Do we get that? <laughs> <laughs> We're not sure. Ask a question. So. But okay, for that anyway, we're going to we're going to um, we're going to take action on the GIF renewal, um, E-rate service provider and I and R S training. Other items discussed. Mr. Price discussed an alternative uh, plan to paying the county fee for the radios, as we discussed before. The uh, <clears throat> we could build our own P25 system. Um, we could reprogram the existing radios that we have, and we can have our own antenna with better coverage because our towers will be interoperable with surrounding agencies, uh, which will communicate with the county and vice versa. So Ms. Ms. Anaya will follow up with Mr. Santilli and Mr. Lamaza, our security coordinator. So that's my report for, or our report for tonight. It was a brief meeting, but we did get a lot of things accomplished. So that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Price. I think it's worth noting, choosy school boards choose GIF. Um, I don't, do I get anything on that, Mr. I hope I get some credit for that. That's funny. No, okay. He's not that was very skippy. But I want to ask um, if there are any questions or comments uh, for finance and operations. I just wanted to do an addition if I can. Sure. And then we can address comments. So I wanted to actually highlight from our committee, um, we talked about talking to the full board about the ACASBO GIF, which is the Atlantic and Cape May County's Association of School Business Officials Joint Insurance Fund. Boom. That is the, we are self-insured for general liability, property insurance, workers' comp. That fund is self-insured with Atlantic and Cape May County school districts and a sprinkling from Ocean County that participates as well. Because we're self-funded, uh, we have our own pot of money we put into with all the districts. We pay for our own claims. So even though something may be covered by the GIF, it is our own taxpayer dollars funding it. At the end of the fifth year, we do a resolution annually to say, hey, there was surplus. We're going to use it towards next year's bill or we're going to get a refund check. Um, this renewal is a three-year renewal. The reason I'm bringing it up to the full board, we talked about at committee, is although it's not due to the GIF until January, that by middle of January, and there is a new board, we don't want to obligate them. We wanted to share with the full board, we've been using this um, resource for years. We go to the retreat, not the retreat, excuse me, the dinner, which is at November 30th, that's a plug, every year, and they educate the board on what it is, what we do, and how we do. However, they are offering to come speak to boards, but their December is filling up. So if we wanted them to present, it would have to be December, and we'd have to notify them after this meeting, or we can renew as just a renewal for next meeting. But the committee said we would talk to the full board to remind them what it is, what we're approving, and see if they wanted them to actually come and present, or is the retreat at the end of this month sufficient? Board members' uh, preference. Uh, I, I, I just wanted to comment. Yeah, we do. I did get the. I think we all got the email for the retreat at the uh, Great Bay Country Club at, at the end of the month. So. That's correct. It's also under communications on this agenda and I'll be sending reminders out to please let me know if you are interested in attending. Yes, no problem. Is any, let me try it this way. Is anyone interested in having uh, the GIF speak to us at our next work meeting? Or are we okay staying with them as our carrier? We're okay? Thank you for that. And then I have the board member questions from our agenda that was submitted on Friday. If I can do that recap. Sure. So we had um, a couple of questions from the board members who received the agenda Friday about some finance and operation items. So uh, the couple things on the bills list, we have um, replacing blinds in the boardroom. In the past, if you've come to our meetings, you've seen some hanging off and some gaps in the blinds. We actually just replaced them um, for similar blinds. 
um, we had on the, for, on the um, bills list payments for portable radios and batteries, and that was for our existing radios. Another question came, we just approved a purchase of radios in August, and that was the purchase, and this is now approving the bills list for those purchases. The minutes for the finance meeting were short because the meeting was short. <laughs> on the agenda is a short urgent care, which Mr. Price re um, read out. It is a replacement for the vendor we used to have for student drug testing. Uh, we have on this approval as well, Ethic Epic Health Services, which is a substitute nurse service. Not our substitute nurses that are in our buildings, but substitute special ed one-to-one -one nurses um, that we usually use Bayada or some other service for if there is an actual vacancy that can't be filled to back up. Plan. So approving that agreement. In addition, we have um, the comprehensive maintenance plan, which is basically a three-year preventative maintenance schedule that we do with facilities. And um, it basically says this is what we do for preventative maintenance by building. And we attach how much we actually spent in a closed year, which in this case is 2021, as well as what we have budgeted for this year, 21-22. And what plans do we have to improve or change our preventative maintenance for next year? And what the dollars may look like as a tentative plan? Because we're going through budget process now, we always keep that last column the same. We also have a math program payment for on the bills list for 79,000. And that was a question um, that came out, is it a new program? And it was actually budgeted for grade six through 12. It's a six year license that had expired. So we're with the same company. However, the series has been updated. There was a hand check for EHTPD for the board approval, and that was for security at our football games. Last but not least, decommissioning of water wells for 8,600 was on the bills list, and that was the conversation we've had at this board to say we had wells that had to be decommissioned. They came and said, we don't have meter readings, and we said, you don't have meter readings because they're not working. They were making us decommission them officially, and we found a vendor to do that for a very reasonable amount of money. And that concludes that portion. <laughs> Any questions or comments, Mr. Ireland? So, Ms. Anaya, you said about the comprehensive plan. Um, so, the same price is the same for 2021 and 2022 budget, and then we're keeping it the same for 2022 to 2023 plan. So, if you pull up the plan, I'm going to put it on my side. So, like for the high school, they're the same thing, $543,000. Um, but my question is, how do we have more tasks? added on for the planned part, but it's the same price. So because we're so early in our budget process, yeah. the government state wants to know what you're trying to do as a plan and how much you plan on spending until we go through our budget process and have a balanced budget. I can't assign a real number. So when we submit the plan to the state, we keep the same amount this year figuring we're going to spend at least as much as we did this year for preventative maintenance. Prices do go up, tend to go up. But unless the board agrees to do a reasonable increase of 2% or 5% or some systematic increase, we just keep it flat. Um, it can go up if the board agrees to change it today. I can do it before submission. But it's always been philosophically just keep it minimally the same as the previous year. Um, so yes, there are more tasks because COVID and other things have happened. We do, probably will spend a tad more or we'll find ways to become efficient and you know um, provide a different way to fund things. But without having that budget process completed, we just keep it flat. Well, I'm just kind of concerned because some of the, um, the planned ones for 2022, 2023, just take an example for our IPM protocols. We say that we're gonna budget that. We did utilize our IPM uh, protocols this year, but it's not on there uh, for this year. I, can, so I that was the plan, comprehensive no problem. plan. So this comprehensive maintenance plan focus on that last column 22, 23. Okay. The state is saying, what did you say you were gonna do and how much did you actually spend? Yes. And then how much do you plan on spending next year? So the columns for 2021, which is a closed year, we planned on doing only A, B, and C, but we actually spent the money on the bottom. For 21, or for 22, 21, 22, our current budget, what did you plan? That's what was submitted last year and our current budget. So although yes, this plan for this year did increase with more frequently filter, more frequent filter changes and more COVID related things, the plan we submitted for that year, which is we're living in, is not what the state's asking for. They're asking for that third column as a reference to say, what do you plan on doing in 22, 23? 
So that was where we put our efforts to say, well, this is a modified plan for 22-23. I understand that. I'm just kind of concerned when we have the word comprehensive maintenance plan and then we're just providing bullets. It's a bullet statement instead of other districts, I guess, going to more in-depth detail um, if you pull up the New Jersey website. Um, so I'm just... So this uh, is a two-part report. Are you talking about the... Um, I, we, we can talk offline. Yeah. Um, this is the format that Herbert Township has been using. I don't mind changing it, but this is how the board has always appreciated this report. I don't know anybody outside of you that might actually read it, <laughs> but if you want me to, we can definitely talk offline on how we can revise this going. Yeah, if we're talking about millions of dollars, I think it would be beneficial for our district to go a little bit more in depth and look at all the minute stuff instead of just like bullet statement form. So this is a preventative maintenance plan. What tasks do you plan on doing? So tasks tend to be bulleted. Yep. Um, we do have a procedure manual for facilities that maybe you might be interested in. I'm not sure if that's the right forum, but for us as a district, we can talk about that though. Okay, that would be great. And and just so I'm clear, at at budget time, the the the, the board would be free to set set that at, at at amount where they think it needs to be. That's correct. During budget time, you will get from Mr. Burnett the very. It's actually in your binders from last year. If you look at that, the two six one lines, the maintenance lines, you will see the tasks listed there with dollar amounts versus just a lump sum to show how we got to the numbers that are in this budget. And at budget time, you can say we need more detail. What do you mean by A, B, C, or D? Um, but what we have been doing is trending, since Mr. Burnett has been on and very organized, we have been trending how much we're spending on certain tasks so that more accurate we are oh, now than we ever really have been. It's usually just been a rough estimate, but Mr. Burnett can tell you over history how much we've been spending on these factors, and that's how we budget now. Very good. Mrs. Gilbert Floyd. <clears throat> With the maintenance, um, is it written in the bullet, the bullet point? format because it's something that so we we're able to understand and comprehend and, and people say well can you read yes we all can read but when you have um, maintenance um, terminology or different things that you know a person who may not work in that field may not understand her so I'm just trying to figure out if it was in bullet point form is that in layman terms for for an average person to read in the detail, um, the manual, is there a manual that lists everything? So we have a preventative maintenance system that, that mm -hmm. has every task and the frequency and the dollars related to it, and that's our FMX system. So that is the more detailed version of what we truly do as preventative maintenance. So is that instead so of repeating, instead of incorporating that level of report. detail here, yeah. we do use the bullet format. Mm -hmm. But if the board pleases, we can have this discussion and we won't, you know, we can bring up through finance stops and revisit this again um, and just say maybe it is something you want more detail for for this purpose and that's fine too. Is it so? What I'm saying is, so I know Mr. Ireland said he, you know, thinks because it's like we're spending a lot of money um, on it. So is that something if whoever's interested in? taking the manual home or being, is it accessible to those board members who we want to read it? We can see what the request is and see if it's appropriate. Okay. Um, I or think maybe it could be uploaded approach. so we could see it. I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, well, would so like suggest, um, I would just like to suggest from finance and operations if I may, we could maybe load something in the board docs mm -hmm. that we could all go through and, and, and look over. I'm not, but I mean, do you mean what? So, I would just ask. Oh, I'm sorry, when I said board docs, I meant the Google Drive. If you could load it into Google Drive for finance and operations. So I would just ask if the board pleases to get more detailed. It's a public document we're supposed to have. So it's either going to be at that level of detail publicly or it's going to be this plan. That would be my only thing. It's not something that we would, I personally would have to look into this a little further to see is it something we can just privately share our software and our operational plan just for the board when it's, it's I don't know. I don't know how that would work. I'd have to look into that. Does it make different sense? Different ask. Does it make sense to make it an agenda item at the next finance and ops meeting? Absolutely. And you we guys have can more information for that. Work Correct. out. I wasn't prepared tonight, so I apologize. Yeah, I what we want the there. report, <laughs> no you problem. know, to look like. Anything else on finance and operations? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we need to vote. Uh, so I'm looking for a motion on 5.2 and 5.3 this evening. So made. Second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, roll call, please. Um, there, one second. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Alabarda? Yes. Mrs. Bird? 
Yes. Mr. Delabarca? Yes. Mr. Ireland? Yes to 5.2, no to 5.3. Mr. Price? Yes. Mrs. Salagi? Yes. Mrs. Gilbert Floyd? Yes. And Mr. Castellano? Yes. Okay, we're gonna move into uh, curriculum and I'm gonna ask for our committee report. The curriculum committee met on October 27th, 2021 at 5 p.m. virtually via Google Meet. In attendance was Mr. Della Barca, Ms. Sullivan, Ms. Moss, as well as myself. Agenda items discussed include field trips and professional development. A curriculum and instruction update was given and updates on administrative professional de development, universal screening, and academic interventions. Data was shared with the committee and how the data was used to help develop the budget for the SR3. The comprehensive health and physical education policy was also discussed as it relates to curriculum and the changes to the new standards were highlighted. Suggestions were made in listing underrepresented groups under diversity and inclusion umbrella. Further discussion will occur in the policy committee meetings and open discussions at future work sessions. Finally, an update on unified sports and the planning for budget and implementation was given. More information around unified sports will be shared with the full board in the near future. Do you have any other updates, Ms. Moss? No, I do not, thank you. Any questions or comments for curriculum? Okay, seeing none, uh, again, we do have to take action on 6.2, which is our 22-23 preschool operational plan. So may I have a motion, please? I'll make that motion. Second. Any discussion? Yes. Discussion. I, I approve of the, the plan, but I'm still concerned about the effect that it'll have on class size. So I just want to make that clear that maybe down the road I may disagree, but right now I'll, I'll say yes. I, I would certainly agree that that's a legitimate concern. Uh, any other discussion? Okay, seeing none. Oh, Mrs. Bird. Um, I, I am also a little bit concerned um, because I'm worried definitely about class sizes, um, but I'm also worried about the busing situation. I know that uh, over the last few months, we've really tried to discuss bringing more busing, buses in-house, not having our special ed kids um, being outsourced. And so I just want to, you know, uh, voice that I'm, I'm hopeful that if we move forward in this direction, that we continue bringing more buses in and that um, we don't have more kids on outsourced buses as a result of it. So um, I'm in agreement with Ms. Salagi. I think probably everyone here is concerned about those things as well. So thank you. Okay. Roll call, please. Ms. Alabarda? Yes. Mrs. Bird? Yes. Mr. Della Barca? Yes. Mr. Ireland? Yes. Mr. Price? Yes. Mrs. Salagi? Yes. Mrs. Gilbert Floyd? Yes. And Mr. Castellano? Yes. Okay, we're going to move into um, personnel, and I'm just going to see if uh, Dr. Charlton has anything for public session. I do not. Thank you, Mr. President. Any questions or comments? We don't have any action to take this evening. Seeing none, uh, I just want to mention, uh, due to a number of circumstances, policy did not have a November meeting, uh, but we will have a December meeting and we have several items already uh, in the queue to work on. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and move to new business. And under new business, uh, again, we're going to be approving the QSAC submission. So I'm gonna ask for uh, a motion on 8.1, please. So made. Second. Is there any discussion on QSAC? 
Seeing none, roll call, please. Ms. Alabarda? Yes. Mrs. Bird? Yes. Mr. Delabarca? Yes. Mr. Ireland? Yes. Mr. Price? Yes. Mrs. Salagi? Yes. Mrs. Gilbert Floyd? Yes. And Mr. Castellano? Yes. Okay, thank you all. Uh, moving quickly to communications, we have a new board calendar, uh, a draft budget calendar coming up. Uh, we, we did speak about the, the GIF dinner at the end of the year. Um, the delegate assembly is November 20th. That's Mrs. Gilbert Floyd and uh, myself as the alternate. Uh, that's the New Jersey School Boards Association delegate assembly where we will vote on resolutions for the state's association. Uh, and I will turn to Mr. Del Barca to see what's new and exciting with the New Jersey and Atlantic County School Boards Association. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, as you all know, the uh, virtual workshop for NJ School Boards Association was last week. Just a reminder that if you were unable to attend any of the sessions, they're available for 30 days. And I guess that's down to about 25 days now, but they're still available. So any of us can go on and attend a, one of the uh, presentations that were made during last week. They had an excellent attendance, I understand, and they were very happy with the program. But they're looking forward to next year being in person again. So hopefully that does happen for all of us. Uh, just a reminder that the Atlantic County School Boards Association hybrid meeting, the next meeting is December 9th. The topic is regionalization. It is again the Atlantic County, uh, Atlantic Co City Country Club. And uh, the in-person dinner is at six o'clock. The virtual meeting is at seven o'clock. So you will be receiving registration from the state uh, shortly regarding that meeting in December. Um, what I would like to do as county president, I'm going to be inviting those newly elected board members who are all three of you are here. Thank you, Mrs. Hyman. We didn't get to say hi, hi earlier, but we're glad you're here also to attend the meeting on December 9th. And uh, Ms. Anaya will be getting information so that I can make sure you get invited by the state, the regular uh, uh, permission form that we have so that you can either attend virtually or in person. And we'd like to have you there. Uh, it's a good meeting and it's a good topic and we want to get you informed as to how we operate as a county association also. So uh, you're all invited to that meeting on December 9th. Um, and tomorrow, I just found out today that there is a webinar program being presented by New Jersey School Boards tomorrow at 11 o'clock. For those of you who are available, uh, you can still go on and register. It's about, uh, the type of topic is creating an in-district orientation for newly elected board members. And I think that's an excellent idea. That way we can develop our own orientation here in the district and orient all our new board members uh, to how the district uh, school board uh, works. Uh, last year, when with the whole COVID situation, new board members who were elected last year really didn't have the adequate uh, detail type uh, orientation that they should have had. And so there was a lot of stuff that didn't happen during the course of the year. And the state was very concerned about that, but there just nothing they could do about it. So this year, they're providing this training for those of us in district. They're also going to be providing the regular orientation, I believe, as soon as uh, people are um, sworn in in January, there's going to be a program available to attend for orientation from the New Jersey School Boards Association. So this is your big welcome to being on the school board here in Egg Harbor Township. And I personally, and I'm sure all of us here who will be on the board in January, look forward to working with all of you. So thank you. Thank you, pre uh, President, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Del Barca. Let me just double check with Ms. Anaya. We have no um, action to take under personnel this evening, correct? That's correct. Okay, so next I know. Next week, it's all there for you to review for next week. Okay, I, I know that there was, uh, I think we have someone here, uh, a new hire, and that, that will be next week. Um, okay. So we'll, we'll please, please, please come back next week. We will be so happy to welcome you with open arms. We can't wait to have you join us. Um, okay, uh, now we're at the point in our meeting where we will have uh, comments, public comments uh, for a period of three minutes. Uh, remember the board cannot discuss personnel or litigation. 
um, please give your name and address for the record. And it may be if you have a, a complicated or a long question, someone from uh, our office may have to get back to you, you know, with an answer. So please come on, come on down. Please step forward. Make sure the mic's on. Sonia Cruz, 207 Egan Avenue. A quick question about the preschool operational plan. Um, besides the issue of busing, will there be any additional um, problems with food service if you're adding these children? Um, so I do need that, would like that question answered. And the, I know I'm not getting answers, but. The other question, um, I definitely am speaking to you directly, but I would love to get in the ear of this gentleman behind me with the ECAC um, council. Um, just to, there's just a couple things that reading through the documents of how we get our stakeholders involved because we're all stakeholders. And I think with children very young, it's a great way and opportunity to educate our parents to how the EHD school districts works. So I would welcome an opportunity to speak to him. I also want to know if there's a, wait, a current waiting list for our preschool program and what happens to people that are put on a waiting list. As far as the ESSER application, because all these acronyms get a little crazy, um, I'm very concerned about looking at the budget numbers under the social mental health component. I wanted to ask about the mentoring programs. Is this adult mentoring programs or is it peer educational programs? Um, because I think we need a combination of both. And there are also community mentoring programs that can be involved. So I'm just, as a person that's very concerned on how we're moving forward, I just want to have a better discussion about in the engagement part of embrace, engage, and educate. I think we really need to step up the engagement part because sometimes things aren't explained clearly. And what is the process to get the correct answers if you can't attend a meeting? I know there's a process, but I think that process has to be clearly explained. Also, I would like to know what's the process if you want a policy reviewed? So at the next meeting, if somebody can give me that information, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to suggest that we try to answer uh, some of those uh, questions this evening, and then we give we have an IOU for um, Mrs. Cruz for for after the meeting as well. But perhaps we can answer some of some of those. Uh, this evening. Uh, the, uh, I can tell you that if um, a uh, member of the public requests that we look at a policy, our, our committee will always take that into consideration. We also look at policies that, of course, New Jersey school boards and our consulting firm, Strauss Esme, inform us uh, must be looked at and we also look at policies at the request of our administration as uh, things on the ground in the schools change and there's a need for a change they'll come to us and ask us for that change um, so with that let's let's see what we can do for mrs. Cruz this evening and then we'll get back to her with the balance okay um, first, Ms. Cruz, you know that, of course, you can reach out to us at any time um, you know, through district administration. Um, if we don't have the answer, of course, we will certainly get those responses for you. Um, a few of the things I can touch on. Um, first, uh, I think Mr. Toland, of course, uh, heard that he, you know, your desire to certainly speak with him. Um, so we'll make sure that he reaches out and, and contacts you. Um, in regards to um, your concerns with dining services, um, and food services in the district. If Ms. Anaya wants to expand on that, she can. But that is part of our, our planning. Um, just like transportation, just like space, just like enrollment, those are all things that we are constantly looking at in an effort to make sure that this expansion continues in the right direction. 
Um, in addition to that, you asked about a wait list currently based off of where we are in regards to our um, plan for this year and what we are not able to exceed. We have approximately 60 kids, um, uh, 60 students on the waiting list. Um, when that occurs, families are notified uh, via a formal communication from uh, Mr. Tolan's office and uh, that way we can keep them up to date in regards to uh, where they stand uh, based off of the waiting list. Um, Mr. Castellano, I believe, answered the, the policy uh, piece um, in regards to um, mentoring uh, and our ESSER grant. Um, Ms. Moss, if you want to expand a little bit on that, where we stand in regards to the mentoring you know, services for our students. So the mentoring program mentioned in there is about building um, an adult mentor, but within a small group that would stay together so that they're building relationships with their peers and learning how to have those conversations. Also in that um, grant, we talked about a real curriculum around social emotional learning, which would help with those peer-to-peer -peer connections. Um, because we wanna make sure that when we are, I agree with you, and we wanna make sure when we are making those connections and having those mentoring that we're doing it from a place that's effective and healthy for our students. So we are starting with the teachers first with that, but that's part of the reason of bringing in that curriculum and getting that training. Um, another piece to that is that we are also have our equity training, which is has a student voice component to it. So part of that is really, um, helping our students understand how to use their voice and how to work together in a collaborative nature as well. So you'll be hearing more about that in the near future um, with, with regards to how we work in those groups. But the idea is to build kind of um, a community within a small group with a teacher that's there but facilitating. And, and just to add one other thing, I just even thought of this that um, I wasn't able to be part of this particular um, I guess Google Meet, let's say, or, or a meeting. Um, this time it was in person, but Noche Latina has been um, a huge part and initiative of this school community. The focus this last meeting, which I believe it occurred two weeks ago, um, was was to really focus in on our, our early uh, intervention uh, families and knowing that we want to catch them early. Um, and then of course, making sure that those that are Spanish speaking are able to be part of that conversation so they know um, what to expect as parents in, you know, as new parents in a school district um, and where to go for those resources and, and answers as well. But again, Mr. Tolan can, can certainly share more information on that as well. Did you want me to pick up the food service piece? The food service piece. So right now, um, they will always, the students actually get fed in the classroom. So we did add another part-time staff to Slayball Ball Primary this year to help because they're not coming to the cafeteria, the caf they're actually going into the classrooms. And for our partners, um, Gateway, um, that Gateway is, what is it called, Head Start. Head Start has their own food service program, but Garden State Academy partners with us and we actually deliver in warming boxes and they also get fed in the classroom as well. So, so far so good on that front. Any other members of the public? Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, we wanted to come to talk to you tonight. My Excuse name is me, Greg Matusin. I'm going to start restart the clock. If you could just please start with your name and address, yeah. I'd appreciate it. Thank uh, you so Greg, much. Greg and Priscilla Matusin, 10 Hideaway Lane in the, here in the township. Um, we, uh, we spoke virtually a few months ago. I addressed the board about their homeschooling policy in regards to co-curricular athletics and sports. Uh, my wife homeschools our daughters. She's a retired teacher from Mainland Regional. I believe she's had one of the school board members here at, at Mainland. Um, so we have uh, two experiences or one request. Uh, our oldest daughter, who would be a freshman this year, participated in uh, cross country uh, and the experience was wonderful. Uh, the liaison at the school was the director of guidance, Samantha Elko, made the process very easy. So we, we really wanted to thank the board for, for their policy, for inclusion, for, for our daughter. And uh, she's decided to do swim as well, which is just starting up and as cross country, country wrapped up. Um, the reason we came tonight is because we have a younger daughter who would be in middle school um, and 
the issue that we addressed with the board last time is the, the homeschooling policy for sports and co-curricular activities uh, doesn't include middle school at this point. It's just for the high school. So when I spoke in September to you all, I asked you to, to consider amending that policy. So I wanted to see if I can get an update because when we got some feedback from our oldest daughter, you know, she was a little behind where she could have been because the other girls on the cross country team had been doing it for a number of years at, at, at a competitive level and, and she didn't have the ability to do that. So uh, again, our, our youngest daughter um, would be in eighth grade and is anxious to play uh, sports in the spring. And so we're hopeful that, that you all would um, consider amending that policy. Um, I've spoken to Samantha Elko. I've spoken to the assistant superintendent about this issue. And I do believe it's something you can implement very, very quickly. You just have to amend a couple policies. And Samantha said she'd be happy to reach out to the assistant superintendent to discuss the really streamlined process she has in place. So um, did you want to add anything? Okay, great. Well, we thank you. Did you have an update on that? I know the last yes. time you said they would take it uh, on the committee. Yes, uh, we uh, unfortunately had uh, a number of things that we had to deal with this fall, uh, some some unexpected, but uh, the update is our, our, our plan is at our December meeting, December 7 is our policy meeting. Uh, we plan to consider those updates. So as the plan is right now, if committee members are okay, we would approve those uh, at the committee level, then we would vote on them at the uh, December regular meeting, which would allow then the students to begin in January. Great. At the seventh and eighth uh, grade level. I mean, I'm in favor of this. I wrote the original policy for high school. Yeah. Um, we never had a request to do it at the middle school level yeah. before, so we kind of just let it sit. And now that we had it, we just happened to have so many uh, various things going on in the fall, we couldn't get it moving as quickly as we wanted, but, but, but that is our plan. Great, thank you, we appreciate your time. Well, Thanks everyone. Uh, other public members, members of the public, please come forward, yes. Hi, Regina Bongiorno, 405 Starfish Lane. Um, first, thank you for um, thanking us for joining the board. And um, I do want to uh, stress uh, from the earlier discussions. Um, I did work at Head Start as an assistant teacher and um, I can speak to the fact that it is a very uh, important, the smooth transition from the home to school uh, for three and four year olds because they're very scared, it's a new atmosphere, there's a lot going on. So uh, if we can do anything to help transportation with taking on this many students, it seems like uh, it could be a domino effect to the teachers and the staff if we're not, you know, smoothly transitioning the children from home to school. Um, also, uh, there's been some very uh, some concerns regarding our plexiglass. Uh, studies have shown that it's not beneficial in preventing the spread of COVID. Um, it's a greater risk to spreading the virus. We should evaluate and revise our mitigation process by removing this plexiglass. Um, no one seems to have an answer. I've been asking for several times, uh, principals, superintendent, um, why some classes have it and some do not. So if we could um, just reevaluate that and see if there's, if we're at a point where we could remove the plexiglass from the classrooms. Uh, I've seen some pictures, my son's in eighth grade. They're disgusting. <laughs> they're very dirty. They're written on some of them and um, broken, not stand, sitting up on the desk the way they should be. Um, so it's very evident that they're not clean and sanitized. Um, and I feel like this is just preventing what we're trying to do. Like it's just becoming more of an issue than it is helping. Um, so that would be one. And then the other thing too, um, I, sorry, lost my turn of thought. On another note, um, an email came out on Friday about consenting to the spit test for our children. I had some questions and I did email the supervisor of nurses. Um, I haven't heard back, obviously. We just came back from fall recess, so that, that's not my concern with her not getting back to me yet, but I'm just curious if you, Mr. President, or anyone on the board knows um, the reason why we are, in the email itself, it said 
that we would be randomly testing children without experiencing system symptoms or being exposed to positive person with COVID-19 for over 15 minutes without a mask. Um, what is that threshold that they're using to gauge that? And also, just like any other test, there's false positives. So what is the course of action if they do come back positive? Is there retesting to be done or quarantine? Um, and that would be it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me see where do I want to start. Um, let me just uh, let me start with the the plexiglass first. Uh, uh, your point is well taken, and I'm gonna uh, hear Steve's um, Mr. Santilli uh, to address that a little. Uh, I hope you can maybe appreciate where we've been sitting up here all during this pandemic. Uh, we started out without plexiglass. We had parents screaming and yelling at us. They wanted plexiglass. You gotta have plexiglass. We got the plexiglass. So now, get rid of the plexiglass. So, you know, conditions change and, and we hear it and, and we're, we're certainly looking to stay uh, as current as we possibly can. I just wanted to throw in a little, you know, history there just just so you can understand, you know, how all these things keep changing and, and, and you know, go full circle. I did hear the governor today uh, that many of these mandates may be sunsetting very soon. Uh, the mask mandate sunsets January 11, as it stands now, if not sooner. So we'll have to see on that. Um, Mr. Santilli, do you have anything to add on the plexiglass? Because, I mean, yeah, I'd like to see the picture as well. Because So in, in the only thing I would add is that, um, you know, we, we were faced with, of course, a, a, a variety of decisions early on, um, even prior to the mass mandates. So we wanted to be prepared going into um, this new school year. Um, and, you know, we were really trying to make sure that we were making decisions in the best interest of the whole. Um, and ultimately, we continue to evaluate. Um, I can tell you that in terms of classes that have plexiglass versus that do not have plexiglass, the decision was made in regards to social distancing. We knew the mask mandate then came about from the executive order. Um, however, then we were faced with trying to make sure we can maintain at least three feet of distancing. And typically in a normal classroom, uh, if there is going to be uh, 20 or more students, we made a decision as a district that it's getting and cutting close to that three feet of social distancing, even with mask wearing. In addition to, of course, wherever students are eating, being in a situation where they're removing their masks um, to eat and making sure that, again, we were trying to provide an extra layer of protection. Um, you know, we certainly have read a variety of different um, research that's out there, both for and against the use of, of said plexiglass. Um, but we continue to reevaluate and we will continue to do so as a district moving forward as well. And then I think on that testing, I know there's a couple of pieces there. I know there was one, one main uh, thing, uh, area of misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. So, and maybe that's where Ms. Mrs. Bongiorno is coming from, or there's more pieces. But I'm going to let you and, and Ms. Hauk Elko uh, address that. Okay. Um, and in regards to the testing, um, ultimately, uh, we have uh, really, it's mandated for any staff that are unvaccinated to um, participate in testing. Our uh, partnership with the New Jersey Department of Health um, basically uh, requires that through this partnership with Rover Labs, um, that we also offer um, to our staff, uh, if they want to be voluntarily tested, as well as offer to our parents, guardians, you know, or students, let's say, uh, that if they'd like to participate in voluntary testing. Again, uh, the key word here, voluntary. Um, so if as a parent guardian, you do not consent for them to participate in testing, um, which would be here at the school district based on the sites that we have set up and the times we have set up in the future, um, then of course, students would not be tested. Um, so again, it's voluntary based off of um, this partnership with the outside vendor. Okay, very good. Anyone else? Public comment? Anyone? 
another one? Sure. Again, sorry, Regina Bongiorno, 405 Starfish Lane. Um, I just wanted to bounce back off of that, though. The, in that email, it said something about a county threshold, like the threshold of like the risk tolerance of where we are. So I understand that it's basically the lab or wherever we're like getting the funding from is offering it to the, the parents that consent to their children being tested, which is great. And other staff members that maybe are vaccinated that want to still get tested. But what I guess are we just pulling just randomly that are in that, you know, in that consent pile just going forward? Or is it like a threshold that we're looking at for is like a risk tolerance? I think that's where I guess my concern is. So I think that um, what you might be referencing in terms of county levels would be the difference between if let's say they would be tested one time per week versus two times per week. Um, right now, based on our county levels and, and levels within this particular region, we'd be looking at one time per week. Um, so until you get to that high uh, level, which would be considered red, I believe, um, we wouldn't be testing or even considering a test two times per week. Um, and again, this is just voluntary for parents to consider if they want to have that extra layer of you know uh, concerns that they may have addressed and you know I think you also had asked a question in regards to what the process would be really what happens is the test would occur parents guardians because they're the ones consenting would receive communication from rubber labs in regards to the results of the test and should the child be positive then we have to immediately start contact tracing I think that the whole you know idea behind this process is to try to get ahead of any type of spread within a particular district or school. Um, and I think that as a district, we've done a pretty good job based off of our current numbers and, and trying to make sure that we mitigate this. Okay, very good. Uh, at this point, I will move the board member comment. Mrs. Gilbert Floyd. Um, I just wanted to, some of the concerns or questions that were brought up, I was thinking about, uh, is it Mr. Toll, the preschool program? Mr. Tolan. Um, Mr. Tolan mentioned that he is working on um, having a pre-K website or Facebook page, you know, for the district. And, and I just wanted to ask that question, I guess, and I'm assuming that that web page um, will outline the process, procedures, and all that. I think all the details and all the processes of how the preschool program works that will be available to the to the public so that they have that you know one of our buzzwords is transparency all the time so it'll have all the information listed detailed so everyone can see it access it so that it's it's clear what the process is from the waiting list all the way to you know the overview of the program where there's an aid in each classroom there's a master teacher there's a whole team for the preschool program, because I think people just need to know where to find it, see it, so they can share it and they can have it. Um, so that was one of my, that's the one question I wanted to see if that's, if that is true, because I heard him mention that. Um, and I guess the other one is the pictures of the plexiglass. I just was wondering, is it, a, do we have pictures of the plexiglass from every school? And mentioned that they were dirty and they were disgusting. So I was just wondering, do we have pictures from every school? And is that the condition of them in every school? And how do we get those pictures? Or how do, how do we know that isn't every school? Is it just, I don't know where to. So um, I'll start with your second question first, if that's okay. Um, first, I, I would certainly welcome Ms. Brongiorno to, to you know, share with me or, or email me any of those pictures. Um, I can also say that I think that you know, it would be a communication that we would have with our building administration to, you know, continue to continually to assess you know, each of our schools, especially in places where food might be, be used. Um, and then to circle back in regards to your question with the website design, of course, I have full confidence in, in what is being yep. built. And as, mm -hmm. as one of our supervisors and administrators in the district, I'm certainly, um, you know, Mr. Tolan has a, a vast amount of experience in regards to his knowledge of preschool. And I, mm -hmm. I have all the confidence in the world that it will be fully transparent in regards to timelines and processes and, and the like. And, and thank you. And I was gonna say that, um, and my concern, not so much if, if the plexiglass is not clean, my concern is also how are pictures being taken? Is it, are students taking pictures or staff? I don't know how that, those pictures, and if you don't, if they're not in the hands of central administration, 
so you can address it. I think that's an issue. And I do have confidence that Mr. Mr. Toma will be able to have that amazing website. I just said that to, to make sure that I was hearing correctly because I know there were some issues or concerns about preschool. And if we're in the process of doing that, I just think that that'll be a, a good tool to help answer some questions from parents um, and also the public. And my last, um, this is a rhetorical question um, because I've, I've heard all of us mention about class size and um, projecting for transportation, projecting for food services. So my question is, or my rhetorical statement is, has the district thought about those particular items, which I'm sure you have, but I just want to make sure that it's clear to the public and to parents that this that is not a fly by night kind of hey we're going to just do we're going to get full full day pre-k and full day kindergarten without a, without a plan to foresee in the future and and that's that's my concern that that's um i think that's i think it's a legitimate question and concern from anyone you know board members and parents and families but i just want to give the district the opportunity to, to kind of speak to that because I've, it's been a reoccurring comment and i just want to make sure that that we have that, that you all have thought about that. I'm sure that you have, but I just want to make sure that it's clear. And I'm, I'm sure that we have, and, and not only that, but again, as I, as I try to uh, stress um, the various aspects of our expanded preschool are in fact grant funded. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, will, I will defer to Mr. Santilli to finish that thought. <laughs> no, no, I, well, but I, I think I it's feel like I just yeah, wanted to I mean, give you the opportunity to speak on it to make sure it's clear. And, and I think we do, the legitimate questions will still come. Enrollment is going to yeah. make sure we have that in straight. Transportation, food, they are important. And I just want to say, can you get the opportunity to tell the public that you that you that you're thinking about it, you thought about it, and we're going to have something in place. We won't be caught with our tail between our legs. So I, I think I can absolutely assure you that these are conversations that we are, are constantly having, um, and ultimately it's, it's always part of our planning. Um, you know, from, from the ground up, um, you know, I think that we have proven, and let's face it, full day, between full day kindergarten and our preschool expansion, um, we, we did all that in a global pandemic, and I think that we've been successful, um, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay, and then just put some legs on it and put it on paper somewhere, your thoughts, so that can be shared. I'm just, that's just my personal opinion, because that way people can say, hey, this is what we're doing, you know, we look at projections, we look at this, we look at that, just so that people know, can, and as a board, so we know too exactly where we're going and how we're going to get there and what we need to do to make it happen smoothly. Other board members? Mr. Ireland. I just wanted to say thank you to everybody that came out for public comment. Um, but I do want to expand on something that we spoke about in executive session, which wasn't appropriate for executive session. It was more for appropriate for uh, public um, conversation. And I believe that we should possibly explore more to the tune of having public comment in the um, area that we were having it for COVID. Um, time frame where we would open it up for emails from the public, we would read them and then we would answer them. I think it would be necessary if we bring back the phone calls. Um, we bought the technology to do that. We should utilize the technology that we bought it for. Um, and I, I think that would be a little, it, we, we talk about transparency, we talk about um, acts like being accessible. I think it would be great. Right now, this is, a, this is a large crowd that we actually have had and we haven't had this crowd, a large crowd in a while. So I think the participation, um, maybe just give it options to different parents. So um, I appreciate all the comments and I hope going forward, maybe not with this board, but with the future board, we take that into consideration. And, and good night. I think we certainly can. Um, this board can, the future board can. I, I just wanna remind everyone that this board decided unanimously that we kept that particular uh, extra uh, participation method going up and until school returned back to in-person. And so that was a unanimous decision of all the board. So if we want to entertain another 
uh, you know, a change to that, that that's fine. It's always been by majority rule. I, I appreciate that, um, I, and I totally agree, and we did vote on that. However, when we have policy in place and we, and that we craft a new policy so that board members can possibly um, participate in electronic means and then we can't, we're inhibiting our own selves by that because we can't do that because we're, we're, we're not expressing that out to the public. I think that's where we kind of our, handcuffed ourselves for that. So I think that's one of the reasons why we should definitely continue on and looking to explore that. Go ahead, Mrs. Gilbert Floyd. Um, I think we need to revisit and maybe revise the policy for um, attending meetings virtually um, for board members. Um, we did vote, we did unanimously vote on that as a board. And I will say this, and, and this is the one thing that I heard nonstop continuously throughout the pandemic. And I, I missed the board meeting because I wasn't able to attend virtually. And I was, I was trying my best, you know. Um, but the main thing we heard was, if the kids are in school, then the board meetings need to be in person. If the kids are back, then we need to come back. And if the children are going to school, the parents can come to the meetings. And can all parents make it in person? No. I think the live stream is great, but I'm just saying, just remember what, what we talked about in the beginning before, where people said, if we're in school, then let's, we're coming back in person, we're all back. So, you know, I know sometimes people can't make it, and I totally get it. I think maybe revising the plan, and maybe if people can call in or if they can email in, but um, yeah, just remember those words. We heard that a thousand times over. We want our kids in school, we want them here five days a week. They're here, we're all back, and, um, and agree or disagree with what I said, I do think that, you know, you can come to the meeting. If, if, if you can make it in person, it's great, and we can have some vehicles where you can maybe call in or what have you, but just remember what we said and what we voted on. And we can change it with the future board or change it now, but it definitely needs to be looked at and revised. Yes, uh, I agree. I just wanted every, you know, everyone to recall that we were asked, you know, no more virtual. Let's ha everyone needs to be back in person. And we responded. And so, you know, here we are. Um, I, I want to have, uh, I just, before we lose the thought, I want to have Mrs. Uh, Hauk Elko explain again the issue with board member participation, where we are with that virtually. Sure, just to clarify for everybody, what happened was we as a district did pass a policy to allow board members to participate virtually. However, COVID happened. And as part of COVID, what the state of New Jersey said was if you're a public body having a meeting and you're gonna have a meeting that I will call it hybrid, where you have some board members in person and some board members participating electronically, that you must allow that same opportunity for the public to participate the same way. So right now, as a board, we are considered in person completely. We don't have any board members participating virtually and we are streaming our meeting. So the public can see what's going on, but we are not accepting public phone calls and emails. What has happened is under the hybrid rules, while we are in this state of emergency, and it's only during this time while we're in this state of emergency, the state of New Jersey has said, if you're going to have one of those hybrid meetings, one, you have to advertise that way, two, you have to allow the public to participate the same way you would a board member, and three, you have to give the public the opportunity to call into the meeting, to ask questions, as well as to email into the meeting. So when we have late notice of individuals uh, needing to participate virtually, we haven't met that criteria to notice properly the meeting. So that's where we're at. Once the state of emergency is gone, board members will be able to participate virtually according to our policy. The only reason we're in these limitations right now is because of the state of emergency during COVID. So I just wanted to clarify that. And I also wanted to add one other item. You as a board currently have a button on your website to email the district. So you can change, you can ask the district to make that button more prominent, you can change that, however you would like to do that. 
but the public can absolutely email the district with questions, with the idea being not all questions are for the board. And what I mean by that is there are times where someone might have a question where they need an answer immediately and they don't want to wait two, three weeks until there's a board, mem a board meeting to actually answer those questions. So that is a tool we have. That is a tool that you can utilize as a district and you do have that capability to change how that looks on the website so you can have that there. But as Mr. Castellano said, as Mr. Ireland said, as uh, Ms. Tamika Gilbert Floyd said, you can certainly change how you're doing your meetings. It's your meeting. Are you, Chandra, are you able to put the front of the web page up for everyone to see the contact us button? It's right there. It's right there on the right. It's big round. Oh, yeah. Boom. Contact, and it says contact us. I have a question, Mr. President. <laughs> the point of clarification, when it contacts us, it, they would have to be specific if it's to the board, and then it would it be read out into the record during a board meeting, or, what, you know, because who's going to filter? It would be wh whatever the nature of the question is. Okay, so of it course. would be read out it could if they request uh, into the record um, verbally from the board secretary. Is so that I do want to clarify that if we're going to allow that, we do have to add some requirements, I'll call them, and that's what is in our public notice. Because for example, if somebody were to email something that contained lewd or profane language, it's a public comment. Now that you've opened that window to say it's public comment, you technically have to read what is written. So if you're going to do something like that, we would just have to make sure that the parameters that we put in place in the public notice for the hybrid meetings are also in place if we're going to start accepting public comments via email. That we're not going to review certain things that we're already saying we're not going to review as part of that public notice, just to be clear on that. Okay, and the other thing was about the um, board members calling in. So pretty much the solicitor explained it correctly. I mean, that, that we can understand um, during COVID, this is what we have to do. When COVID emergency is over, it'll revert back to what it is that is in the policy. But at this point, we're, we're, this is what we have to do. I don't think there's anything that you can really change. At, at least that's the way I'm hearing it. Mrs. Bird. Thank you. Um, while uh, we did vote unanimously on this issue, I'm the first to admit that I was confused. <laughs> I didn't know I was confused, but I was apparently because what we're doing during the state of emergency versus the policy that we passed and and I do remember a healthy debate about having um, our community being able to still email and have the questions read and our community still being able to call in. The calling in part was a sticky one. We had disagreements a little bit, but I don't recall that we came to a unanimous decision, even though we voted, like I said, I was, I guess, confused, which happens, right? It happens. I made a mistake, I guess. But I feel like we need to do whatever we can to have more parents be able to participate. And yes, coming to a meeting and coming up to the mic is a great way for people to come and voice their concerns with us, but we have really busy parents too, just like we're all busy. We take time to come here, of course. Um, we hope people can do that as well, but we have some single parents who have no one to watch the kids, and if they were able to call in and ask a question, or if they were able to shoot an email and have it read, and you know, because chances are one person's question, there's 50 other people who have the same question. So I just think that whether it's this board or the future board, if you guys would consider um, making it easier for families to participate, I think that's a positive thing. Even if we don't always like what they're saying, because it's easier to, to have comments over a phone when you're not looking at people in their eyes. It's just like kind of like the internet. People can say whatever they want mm. when they don't have to you know, come and stand in front. Um, it is easier sometimes, but you know what, we take the good with the bad because if it's easier for families to, you know, serve their kids dinner and call and listen in and be a part of it and engage more with us, 
that's a good thing. But circling back, that's just my opinion. Um, the plexiglass, you know, that was a, that was a, we fought for that plexiglass. It was an expensive purchase. We, we, we figured the plexiglass beats a virtual screen, right? So we got the kids in. We, you know, we, we made the best decision we could at the time, and it was a good decision. There's a lot of schools that couldn't do that, and there's a lot of schools we heard about that they have plexiglass, they've been open, why can't you do that? And we did it. But I'll tell you, that plexiglass needs to be cleaned. It should be cleaned. I mean, kids can be dirt, kids can be gross, right? So can adults. My classroom, some days, I'm like, woo, this is a real thing. This is germy. There are germs. But if we have plexiglass, and it has to be cleaned properly, and we budgeted for wipes, and we budgeted for spray, and we budgeted for more um, staff. So I just want to make sure, you know, things, there's going to be dirty days, right? So we could take a picture one day, but that's not the norm, I'm sure. But let's make sure it's not the norm. So I just want to be assured that these are being wiped nightly, and if even more than nightly, if, it's, if there's a problem, if someone sneezed, gross, thank God they have the masks on, but um, can you only imagine if that wasn't there, but like that they're being wiped. And, you know, that's just a minimum kind of thing. That's an easy fix, right? If they're falling down, fix them. You know, I know I have few. I have to take them off, but um, I only have three in my classroom. I don't have the benefit of it, all of them. But anyway, that seems like a pretty easy fix, like, right? Make sure it's clean. Um, thank you for bringing it to the attention. I'm sure that can fix. Okay, so, but circling back for the next board. Um, could you consider in the budget process possibly looking into apps that parents can use to scan forms so it can be translated into the language that they might use in home? Because I think that part of the engagement issue, right? We were talking about engagement. Part of the engagement issue is that like some families don't feel connected because there's access issues. So I'm sure there's an app out there or something, or I know um, my niece and nephew's high school, they have just every form, the, everything on the website, the parents can click on a language and the website changes to that language. So that's all, I'm sure there's something. Could we just look into that? Hopefully that could help parents feel um, more connected to our schools. That's it, thank you. Very good, anyone else? Any other board members? Okay, so I want to thank everyone for coming out. Next week we're going to hear from our um, uh, student reps. We're going to hear a superintendent's report about the great things going on in the district. We're really off to uh, a start of a, a great school year while we're a good bit into it now. We've got a lot of great things going on. Our, our fall sports and uh, band season uh, wrapped up very successfully. We have a musical coming up and there's lots of great things going on in the district and we'll hear about those uh, next week during our superintendent's report and our and report from our uh, our student representatives. So thank you all for coming out. Have a great night. We'll see some of you next week if you choose to c come back for a repeat performance. Um, and with that I will look for a motion. Okay, unanimous, we are adjourned. Good night, everyone.